Okay. So we've been going over the past, I want to say like a month or so on the atonement, not right after since I've missed a couple of days, but um, it's about been four parts. And we've just really been kind of trying to understand a little bit more as, as to what happened on the atonement of Christ, the working of Christ that he did on the cross in exchange for us, substitute for us, representative of us before God as, as a sacrifice and ultimately paying for sins and having forgiveness of sins counted uh, to us. So after we looked at the death and all the things that occurred there, we're going to transition now into the resurrection. And this series will probably take well, three or four Sundays or so. So today will be an introduction to resurrection. And what that means for us, we're going to look at biblical evidence and, and where in the Bible is it and, and, and what, what does it mean? You know, we looked at resurrection and, and how it applies to us. So all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, both testify and witness to what is happening in, in the earthly ministry of Christ and after the death and resurrection of Christ. And it's, I have here um, where they're at in, in all parts of the Bible, Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. These narratives are found here giving a, they bearing witness to what occurred, but we're going to read the shortest one. So if you can open your Bibles to Mark 16, 1 to 8, and we want to read the shortest one for sake of time, but you can go back and read um, those, those chapters, and they're, they're quite extensive in the narrative of his resurrection. So for the introduction, we will go ahead and read uh, at least one of the Gospels. Um, yeah, there we go. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and, and Solomon, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw, that, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Five. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus of Nazarene, who was crucified and has risen. So we have the crucifixion, we talked about the work of the cross, atonement, and there right after we have that he has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid, where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So we have the resurrection, the accounts of the resurrection in all the Gospels. And we see that there's a continuation into the New Testament of the things that are to occur. Right after that, we get into, into Acts, which is the things that are, 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 are kind of still happening and still occurring. You have the Gospels, the first four books of the Testament, telling us about the life of Christ. And then shortly after, 40 days that, that he spent in, uh, coming back in a resurrected body. And then you have Luke writing the, the book of Acts. So let's jump quickly into Acts 1, verses 1 through, through 3. And this is Luke um, writing to Theophilus. In my former book, meaning Luke, um, the previous book that he wrote, the gospel, Theophilus, I wrote about all the things, all that Jesus had began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, remember we talked quite intensely about the suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He had appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So here there's an implication when we read Acts. We see that in the earthly ministry of Jesus that we see in the Gospels, we see that in Acts is that he's continuing his ministry from heaven. And, and, and if we, I, I don't have it in my notes, but I actually want to keep reading it because um, it talks about the empowerment of, of the Holy Spirit. Can we put Acts 1-3 up there? And we won't get too much into um, the Pen Pentecost, but this is where we get a lot of our theology from. So go up to 4. No, no one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard 
me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days I will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Six. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Seven. He said to them, it is not for you the dates, it is not for you to know the, the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. Eight. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There is a continuation that although Jesus has risen, he's resurrected, ascended into heaven, it doesn't mean that the story stops there. He, he tells them, his disciples, wait, I, I'm going to continue to do a work in you and continue to grow the kingdom of God. It, it's a continuation of what's happening. It's not that, uh, that he dies, he resurrected, and okay, we don't hear from, from Jesus anymore. He, he, he allows his spirit to, to, to descend into our presence, into our hearts, convicting us of a truth, of a gospel that needs to be spread to all, all men, all nations, all, everyone. Make disciples in my name, and you will be empowered to do so by the Holy Spirit. We get a lot of our theology from this as Pentecost, as we read in Acts at the, the, the day of Pentecost, when they're all baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then you get a, such a great diaspora, dis, dis, by disbursement, or, yeah, of, of, of Christianity. It would only be that something like that would occur, that there would be a rapid explosion. If there was a lie to be said about, well, Jesus died, but he wasn't God, and it was just some random dude, or, or he didn't resurrect, how would people be so convinced to go and preach and be empowered about something that was a lie? There's implication when we look at the things in the Bible. Okay, so why, and how did this occur thereafter? Why is Christianity suddenly exploded that we all hear up until this day about such a man that died on the cross and paid for our sins and was, in fact, resurrected? It's something that some people have to take by faith or, or, or by reading the scriptures. Do you believe what the Bible is saying? Acts is a story of Jesus continuing his ministry from heaven to build his church and bears witness of the resurrection, the continuation. The epistles also, the letters in the Bible. We read in the New Testament that a grand majority of it is, is kind of dependent on his resurrection. If, if there is no resurrection, then where is, where is salvation? And then we go into John and Revelation well, John writing Revelation, receiving the prophecies and visions of a time to come where Jesus returns for his church. See, right now, we're, we're kind of lucky because we're living in a period of grace. We have when Jesus died. We read that in the Gospels 2,000 years or so until his return for the church. We're born somewhere right in the middle or maybe in the later end, depending on how you look at eschatology, the study of the end times. But we're, in a, we're living in a period of grace. So lucky to experience and hear this gospel being preached. Some of you guys wonder, well, why do we go to church or why am I Christian? It's because in the timeline of things to happen, for some reason you're born here now and you have received and you've come to have the conviction and the Holy Spirit li living your heart where you know these things are true, right. that it's not something that was made up. You have a bunch of things in the New Testament that are dependent upon the fact that there was a resurrection. Without it, our Christian livelihoods would, would, would be, a, I don't know, would be empty, would, would have a fallacy, would have something wrong in the equation, so to speak. A lot of this relies, the doctrine of resurrection is all over the New Testament. The New Testament is talking about a man who died on the cross, paid for your sins, and was resurrected. And the implications of that is that you too will be resurrected. So in summarizing this, this little part, the evidence and the facts that we are teaching, the apostles in the early church, meaning the first century church, because that's when the, the, the New Testament was written, you have Jesus dying at 33, and then you have the early century, you have the book of Acts in 60, and then 20 years later you have Paul writing and giving his, his, his accounts of things that he received. And, and, I, and we'll refer back to, to Paul let me, let me not jump too far ahead. Um, so we have the disciples teaching with high standards, high moral standards, including truthfulness and speech. It's very much in the character of the things that they're witnessing to that it had to be consistent that they were speaking of some truth. 
when they're spreading the word. Remember, back then, there was no Facebook or MySpace. It was all by word of mouth. And when they spoke about these truths, they would die for these truths. It's not that they would take it so lightly. It would go contrary to the character of, of, of these men that are inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these books of these current events at that time. What is happening? And, and I, now I wanted to read. Uh, we'll back, jump back up to, to Acts 1.3. After his suffering, he presented himself to before giving per, convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So you have him, Jesus, speaking to people in the physical self. And, and we read it all over the New Testament. People struggle with this. They, they believed him at the time, but then they're like, oh, well, is he really God? I don't know, man. A lot, a lot of things are happening these days. Who knows? There's a lot of false teachers, a lot of things that we just don't know. But when he actually presents himself, people are in awe. They're like, dude, this guy actually came back to life. This guy was who he says he was. He is fulfilling the prophecies that he talked about. And you have people, yeah, I think you have what? I was a Thomas. He's like, nah, dude, that's not you. And then he has to tell them to touch him. Touch me, I have flesh and bones. I am back alive. Now, what does that imply for us? Because I struggle with res resurrection. I struggle with the, the thoughts of eternity. The thoughts of, man, I'm going to die and then I'm going to come back. Just as much as you guys are going to die someday, that you guys will be here someday as well. It's, it's, it's kind of like such a profound thing when we think about resurrection. You think, oh, well, there's, we die and then there's a laughter in life. But what does that mean? And Jesus is the first example of that, of what that means for us. And it's almost hard to believe as his disciples and, and people that were around him that saw him die physically are now witnessing his resurrection. So then we get Paul's account of that 20 years later. Let's read 1 Corinthians 15. Three, if you could put that up on the screens for me. First Corinthians 15, 3. And we'll go ahead and read. Uh, for what I received, I passed on to you as first importance. This is significant. What I'm going to tell you, forget about everything else that you've learned and you've been told. This is important. Please listen to me in this public letter addressing the church of Corinth uh, uh, to the people. He's telling them, this is important, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. We talked about that, the atonement and how he dies for sins, that he was buried and that he has raised on the third day according to the scriptures, five, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some, of, some have fallen asleep. If you fell asleep, say amen. If you're awake, say amen. amen. Half of you are asleep. That's how I checked that. But these are eyewitness accounts. He appeared to people, 500 people. And then 20 years later, Paul's writing to the church in court. You guys were there. Yet some of you guys, I don't know how, you guys fell asleep to the fact that Jesus was resurrected. People still struggling with, oh, man, did that happen? And I was thinking, because it's 20 years later, so I was thinking, okay, well, can we remember things that happened 20 years later? And I was going through, and I looked up online. I'm like, well, what happened in 1998? And I was like, ah, 20 years. I was eight years old, so I don't know. Uh, Pokemon was the rage. I think Harry Potter, the book, had come out in the early 2000s. You get the movies. But then I looked up that Google came out in 1998. So something so impactful, that significant. I mean, not to say Jesus is like Google, but, but something that would affect the future. It's 20 years ago. I, I've lived that day. Probably don't remember it much. I was a little kid. But for you those that are older, can you remember what happened or occurred in 1998? Being reminded, hey, you guys saw this. This isn't nothing new. I, I, unfortunately, I wasn't there. But hey, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a first importance. It's been passed to me, and I'm passing it back to you, this knowledge of the resurrection in this public letter to historical historical fact. And people around there were alive and actually saw Jesus. They touched him. They ate with him. They touched his arm. They knew he had risen. Um, we get evidences like this from multiple authors. You know, speaking of the New Testament authors, high moral standards, integrity, and in giving the events that occurred. We, we spoke of that. So then what's the big deal? 
some guy died, and then he resurrected. Well, some people die for 10 minutes, 30 minutes, and then suddenly they're a miracle, they're alive again. But for someone to die three days, three days and nights, according to the way the Jews judged time back then, that, that, that he, would, he was resurrected, that he, he lives. See, we, we can look at this as like, okay, so what? But what does that mean for us? That when he's renewed back into his body, that he has the fullness of breath, the fullness of life, the fullness of strength. His body is glorified. We look at that as an example for us. I have in here uh, John 2.19. He answered to them, destroy this temple and I would raise it again in three days. He prophesied of a day to come when they would destroy the, the, the kingdom of God, the body, the temple, us. And then rise it again in three days. Thinking then, well, well, well what do you mean? A physical building takes decades to build. Well, don't quote me, but I don't know. But, but it was not, not, certainly not in three days. But he was talking about the body of Christ. That salvation would be given to us. That the, the thing that would be built up is the resurrection of all those who would believe and come forward and have the faith. Kind of great implication that it has here as we read about the resurrection. So let's dive quickly into the nature of the resurrection. That was a little introduction, um, as I think I took about 15 minutes or so. But let's look at the nature of the resurrection. So while, the, while Christ's death was a culmination of all harmful results of sin in the world, the resurrection was a triumphal reversal of all those harmful results of sin. So we have the peak of sin being paid for at the cross, and now we have everything be reversed with the resurrection. So we look at, I have a list here. So in, in Jesus' crucifixion, he was put to death as a, result, as a result of the consequence of carrying the sins of the world. But in the resurrection, he was brought back to death from life, a physical um, resurrection. In his crucifixion, he suffocated to death, but when he came back, he had the fullness of the breath of life, the same breath that God gave to Adam and Eve, kind of restoring things back to the beginning, reversing all the things that occurred from the fall of man, now living under a period of grace, bringing us back to the beginning, into relationship and into a, a, a covenant with God, uh, uh, something, uh, life. We, right now, if you guys didn't have the gospel, you're, you're living to die. But here you guys are living to live on forever. Such a period of grace that, that, that God, through his mercy and, and his work, his atonement, his propitiation, his favor, he won the favor of God for us, that we can carry that. And the breath of life is given back to us. So in the crucifixion, he was put to death in shame. We talked about that. That under Roman law, a Roman cannot be crucified because it's for a shameful things. It's things that are disgraceful. And not even a Roman would be allowed to be put on a cross like that for a public shame for everyone. Yet in his resurre resurrection, he is, he is granted glory and honor and we still worship him until today. Some of you guys wonder, well, why do we worship Christ? Why do we sing these songs? Why do we glorify his name? Because he's already paid the penalties, and he has, he has the glorification that comes with the resurrection. And you too will be glorified in such a, a, a resemblance of Christ-likeness that we would carry. So that's why we continue to worship Christ, resurrected Christ, not the one that's still on the cross, still bleeding. No, that, we, that, that happened. We understand that. But now he's glorified, sitting in the kingdom at the right hand of God. And the, the presence of God is right there. And he's telling us, come forward. Something crazy when we think about, I, I don't deserve it. I can do nothing to earn it. Yeah, I, I can humbly, God, thank you. I can step a, an inch closer to your presence this morning as I, as, as I seek more of what this means. So he was abandoned by his disciples. We talked about from his father. When he turned his face, he was forsaken. But he would return back into fellowship and in the good pleasure of the father. Perfectly fulfilling the obedience that we couldn't do. Fulfilling the law, the Mosaic law, the Old Testament that no man could do. Yet he fulfilled that on behalf of us that now we can step into the presence of God. So when you die from here to who knows when. I don't know if anyone's going to die today. But you will step into the presence of God. If you have the faith and the record of the perfect obedience of Christ counted to you. So 
We have that. The, the, that his, the relationship was disrupted, but now he has good pleasure before the God. He's back into fellowship. He's renewed his fellowship with his disciples as he spent time with them, as we read, for 40 days. And ultimately millions, I think it's more billions, of people are brought into a relationship with him. From that point on forward, that we have an opportunity to have a relationship with the resurrected Christ on behalf of God. Remember, we talked about this ooh, maybe like a year ago, that Christ is to us a representation of God. And Christ is to God a representation of humanity. He mediates between us. His spirit is the seal on our heart. That, 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 that it testifies and witnesses, no, this person has the faith. He's confessed with his heart. Not just by lips saying, I believe in Jesus, but he's confessed. And he believes it. And it's not just willy-nilly, oh, yeah, okay. No, but it's impactful. There's a changing in my heart that I have been saved. There's a transformation. I've looked at my old ways and now living a new way. Getting a taste of, what the, time, of the things to come of the fullness of his strength, the fullness of his glory. We can experience that until we are fully resurrected. And then we can uh, dwell and, and be in the presence of God. So let's continue this list. So he was forsaken, but then he was reconciled to God. He was filled with pain in the crucifixion, but the resurrection brought him a new kind of body that would never have the same kind of pain again. He was condemned, then brought back into justification, innocence or freedom of guilt, and condemned because he carried our sin. But now he's brought back into the innocence. He's brought back into the, the freedom of that guilt. I don't have to carry this anymore. It's been done. It's been paid. And now I can live as resurrected and, 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 and glorified and honored. And he's inherited everything from the universe as he was created, created the universe with God. And now he rightfully sits at the right side of, of God on the throne. So we have the, that as well. So let's read Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 3. And this is where I'm talking about the heir of all things. There we go. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son is a radiance of God's glory, an exact rep representation of his being. Things that I mentioned, he represents God to us. Sustaining all things by his powerful word, after he had provided purification for the sins, the atonement, resolving the need that we couldn't do, fully rejecting sin, was able to purify us of our sins by his blood. He sat down at the right hand of the, of the majesty in heaven. All these things that I'm said right now, these past three, four minutes, are here explicitly in the Bible. That he now, it's someone that had nothing, everything taken away from him at the, at the cross, now is given everything in creation, inherited to him, along with... The, 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 I don't want to get into the Trinity today. We'll save that for another, another series. But, but that, that he's inheriting everything that now in his resurrected self, that he has everything in his hands. That he, everything in creation is inherited to him. Going from being on a shameful death, on the sin, all the, the condemnation, all your sins that we commit daily on him, yet now... He's inheriting everything that he speaks before us on behalf of God. And through his Holy Spirit brings us into a relationship, conviction. We, uh, Consolador, our comforter, such a beautiful verse, that, that he, he, we have a relationship with, with, with Christ. And remember, today's ideas, or the big theme here is resurrection. What's the implication of this? So in the application, there is a sense of all these things that we experience of life. I experience suffering, sickness, disease. Maybe I don't know if I have a disease, but we experience these things in a fallen state, in a falling, falling world, right? We, we experience these things, but we get to taste the things to come. When Jesus resurrected, all these things are eliminated for him. He reaches a point of full glorification, it's like we get a taste of heaven now on earth. So when you can put your faith in Christ and you suffer no longer, it, you thank God for that. You thank his resurrection as an ex example of that for us. 
So we get older, we get sick, and we're subject to death, and we die, but ultimately we get a resurrection body. Jesus earned that for us. He, he purchased that for us through his blood, that we also would be resurrected someday. Uh, I'm not one to say when, but someday that will be our possession. possession. So Jesus purchased for us a resurrection body, that's like his. We have life. We are brought into pos- position of honor, stewardship over the earth, into wonderful relationships with all of God's people, free from suffering, sickness, brought into innocence, freedom of guilt. Because some of you guys carry that guilt and you're like, man, I can never serve. Or man, I can, uh, why me? Or I, can, I can't. You, if you knew the things I did behind closed doors or if you knew my past, you would be like, dude, what are you doing here? Us with our judgmental minds, probably. But we're free from that guilt. That, that's what that means for us. That you don't have to carry that anymore. That you can walk into the presence of God and be forgiven. And God loves you. And he will continue to have mercy and continue to forgive you. Obviously, don't abuse it. There should be a continuation of growth. But we, you at least have that as a starting point. The forgiveness of sins. And we, we can get a taste of that, if that makes sense. Not in the fullness, but as a sample that, hey, okay, I, I, can, I think I see what's coming when I'm resurrected. I think I can get a glimpse of heaven, that, that in a resurrected body, we're going to be free from, from all the things of this world that, that are failing us, falling into condemnation, that we're free from it. Um, let me give an example 1 Corinthians 15, 23. But each in turn, this one's short, Christ, the first fruits, then when comes those who belong in him. So in his resurrection, he's the first fruits. The Greek word for you is aparche, which means in the, in, in the context, it's the first fruits of the crops of the season. When they knew that, and, and when they're looking at this in Greek, the, the harvesters or the farmers would understand what the first fruits mean. That means when the first fruit starts to come from the crop or the harvest or the season, you're going to get a taste of what's to come. Whether it's oranges, clementines, or, or wine, for those of you that like fermented wine, you can get a taste of what's to come from the crop. That he's an example of first fruit. So as he's resurrected, okay, we see what's coming for the rest of the body. He's the first fruits, and then us being resurrected as, as he comes for the church. That is why it is important to know what it's like in his resurrection body, because it means that's what we're going to have. That's what this implies, that ultimately we're going to live in the same state as Jesus, in the same state of nature, that free from guilt, free from sin. Kind of crazy to think about. And, and, and I, I kind of think about, the people that saw Jesus in, 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 in the New Testament. For example, when he, when he came back, uh, he, he was walking along the street, or along the road, not street, the dirt road, and, and two disciples saw him, and they didn't recognize him. But he broke bread, he ate with them, and then when the veil was released from their eyes being opened to who he was, he disappeared. Or with Thomas, when he told him to touch him. It's kind of like a foreign idea to us that when it's there, it's like, okay, what? I don't know, maybe I, maybe I jump into like a, a, a weird like trip here when I'm thinking about, well, what is the resurrection like for myself? Where will I be in myself? Will I recognize any one of you? Will you be there? I don't know. There's certain things that the, the Bible isn't explicit on, isn't specific, isn't detailed on, but that's where faith comes in. And I have faith, or I, I'm hoping that I see you guys there, if you truly have faith in Christ. Something to think about. I don't know, I just pondered about what it was like. So coming to a close, I just want to read a couple of Bible verses that gave evidence to, um, to his physical nature, that is resurrection. Matthew 28, 29. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him and grasped his feet and worshiped him. Physical, physically, they touched him. Luke 24, 39. Look at my hands and feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. I'm not a ghost. There's like some weird theologies out there. Well, did Jesus really did resurrect? Or was it just an appearance of, uh, of Christ? Or was it just like a ghost and he just appeared? No, but it was a physical nature. That you too will have a physical nature after you die. That it won't just be 
your spirit in a sense, but you will have your actual, and don't ask me what age, because I don't know, you probably want to go back to when you're pretty 18 years old or 20, when, at your peak of your strength, so to be, or of your beauty, but it's not detailed there, as some of you guys are probably praying for, but, but you're going to have a physical self. Let's continue there. When he said to them, he showed them his hands and feet, and while they still did not believe because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat here? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he, looked, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He ate fish. He, he actually, physically, he ate something. So something to think about. He tells Thomas to touch him. I had that he prepared breakfast for his disciples and other Bible verses, but we'll, we'll bring it to a close here. In conclusion, the whole New Testament lays great importance on the resurrection of Christ. If you don't have resurrection of Christ, you get some random dude who wasn't the Messiah at a, an appointed time, and then suddenly everyone's just being conned ever since then. But how is that so? How could there be a great, I guess, spreading of the gospel? It would only be by a miracle, by, by, by them themselves being so convicted, hearing a truth, being transformed, that they would walk. Who knows how far? How many of you guys are willing to walk to Florida to go preach the gospel? Because they didn't have cars back then. Yeah, they went and were sent, and they preached, and they made disciples. Yet some of us can't get up to get the control to change the channel. Or take our plate to the sink after we eat. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe as you guys, not me, but. <laughs> but it's an example of the conviction they had when they heard the gospel. Such a truth by people that had such integrity consistently. And he talked about them, their struggles. You talk, Paul talks about the struggles of his conscience, things that he needs to do, but he doesn't do. And the things that he's not supposed to do, he does. These aren't people that are just putting on a facade. I'm talking about real men under the, the influence of the Holy Spirit. Bring his biblical evidence. And I know this is a conclusion. I'm going on a, uh, on a rant here, but let, let me finish this. He wouldn't have been the true Messiah. The Holy New Testament wouldn't have been written. It wouldn't. If that wasn't Jesus, if that wasn't a real resurrection, we wouldn't have the New Testament now. You just wouldn't hear this gospel right now. We would still be living under a period of the law. Still nothing to do to save yourselves and uh, like, it's kind of whack I don't know another way to say it. I don't want to say it but it, it would be unfortunate there you go it would be unfortunate for us to live under the law because we could do nothing on our own straight to earn God's favor earn salvation so we should live with hearts of gratitude under this period of grace that fortunately you are breathing and alive and experiencing fellowship friends family church school work whatever Evidence from authors of the New Testament, reversal of sin in our lives, a taste of heaven now, but then the fullness of his glory when he comes for his church. So we are waiting. We're in a waiting period for the return of Christ. And then we give in our, our, our own resurrection. If you're alive when Jesus comes, and then you're not a resurrected body. You just go straight into, but there's a transformation, there's a glorification. Then we are living in a period of grace after his death, but before his return. That's where we're living now. We're living after he died, resurrected, sitting in heaven. But we're not living in the time where he comes back, where we're waiting patiently, glorifying him. Thank you, Jesus, giving me salvation. Thank you for forgiving my sins. God, come already soon. If Jesus came right now, it'd be awesome. I'd hope to see you guys there, but it would be a great thing. Maybe we should pray about it. Jesus, just come for your church already. I'm getting a taste of what it is now. Can I just have it now? But don't kill me, please, <laughs> as some of you guys would say. And if not, then you live with the happiness of joy in your heart. That when someone dies and we have a funeral here, hey, our, our hearts can rest at peace. They, they believe. They had faith. They're resting with, with, with God. They're in the presence of God. As I say, RIP, rest in peace. So something, something we could all look forward to in the resurrection. So that was today's introduction, and we'll continue this series, maybe two or three Sundays. So we'll go ahead and pray for this. I'll ask you guys.